This week, there was a very important anniversary for Egyptology. 200 years ago, Jean-François Champollion presented his letter to Monsieur Dacier, in which he described for the first time in well over a thousand years a correct way to read ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. This was more than a decipherment, it was the unlocking of a language, and from that day on, ancient Egyptian history was open for the world to study, not just as a series of magnificent buildings or beautiful and mysterious artefacts, but as a human society speaking with its own voice. And this event was called, this very week, the Birth of Egyptology. I wasn't so sure I liked that very much, and because I'm a content creator, I decided to make a thing out of it. Now obviously, the letter to Monsieur Dacier was the birth of the modern paradigm of Egyptology. Egyptology as a historical exercise with considerably less guesswork. Egyptology is more than just treasure hunting and Bible-based speculation, and yes, Egyptology is a solid concept as a word. But the study of ancient Egypt goes back well before European interest. For one thing, although religiously and culturally there was a pretty huge shift when Egypt joined the Islamic world in the 7th century CE, there was no sudden displacement of indigenous Egyptian people. Just like when Alexander installed Ptolemy to rule, it meant a change in the hierarchy in the ruling class, but the Egyptian people were still Egyptian. They'd long since lost the general use of the hieroglyphs. The last known hieroglyphic inscription dates to 250 years before the Rashidun Caliphate conquered Egypt and brought Islam with it, so by the time the Islamification of Egypt was taking place, the hieroglyphs were already unreadable. But they were no less intriguing, and Islamic scholars came from far and wide to study them. One scholar who made a serious effort is believed to have been Ibn Washir, an Iraqi scholar of some note, and with diverse interests, who is currently credited with authoring the Book of the Desire of the Maddened Lover for the Knowledge of Secret Scripts, which included an attempt to list the phonetic value of the hieroglyphs. Although this work isn't thought nowadays to be particularly accurate, Ibn Washir did happen upon something that many scholars of the hieroglyphs ignored, that the signs had phonetic value. They weren't an example of rebus writing where symbols are used to mimic their own sounds, or of pure symbolism where each bird and sitting man and part of the body had an intricate role in some strange narrative. Now without understanding a written language there was always going to be a great deal of mystery surrounding the ancient civilization. But we must never confuse that for a lack of curiosity, a lack of Egyptology. We can go back even further than that. Many Egyptologists with a broader view will say that the first Egyptologist was a son of Ramesses the Great, called Chaim Waset. He had an illustrious career as a priest and as a restorer of buildings, tombs, temples and statues, which were even from his perspective in the 14th century BCE, ancient. For example, he conducted work on the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser, which was 1300 years old in Chaim Waset's lifetime, equivalent to a Norwegian today performing restoration on an ancient Norse burial mound. In restoring these things, which included a statue of one of Khufu's sons, Chaim Waset was making a connection to the distant past. He had one big advantage, of course, hieroglyphs were still in use. Even before Chaim Waset, Thutmose IV probably counts as an Egyptologist. Supposedly inspired by a dream, he ordered the excavation of the Great Sphinx, and recognised that it represented the pharaoh Khafre, whom Thutmose deified in a stela he had placed in the Sphinx's arms. I'm not suggesting that Thutmose or Chaim Waset were interested in the scientific endeavour of Egyptology. Thutmose was obeying a prophecy that promised him a throne, and Chaim Waset was attaching his own name to ancient monuments for the glory of his dynasty and for himself personally. But Egyptology is many things. It is a scientific discipline, but it's also an artistic one and a historical one. Why shouldn't it, for Chaim Waset and Thutmose, have also been a religious one? Now, these Egyptologists from long ago, Chaim Waset, Thutmose, Ibn Washir, they didn't have a causal role in the founding of modern Egyptology. Chaim Waset and Thutmose's work couldn't have even been known about until we could read hieroglyphs after all, and Ibn Washir's work wasn't widely known, though in fact an English translation of it appeared a good 14 years before Champollion's letter, and it's from this English translation that people like me who can't read Arabic can see how widely off the mark Ibn Washir would turn out to be. And you might say, look, hold on, if I'm a younger sibling, I don't represent my older sibling being born again. Egyptology had been unsuccessfully attempted many times, and was the first time successfully in 1822. But I don't buy that. 
Fields of study aren't people. A person can be born only once, but Egyptology, like chemistry, astronomy, mathematics, has had many births, many great leaps forward. We have to be cautious about ascribing too much importance to the interest of 19th century European scholars. It would be churlish to pretend that the letter to Monsieur Dassier didn't represent a tremendous leap in accessing ancient Egyptian history. And while the Rosetta Stone wasn't itself very important, and there could have been any number of other artefacts that unlocked the reading of hieroglyphs, it was the one that happened to play a crucial role. We should celebrate these things. It's a neat anniversary. But the birth of Egyptology? The very first time we should take seriously any curiosity about ancient Egypt? To call it that is to erase hundreds of years and perhaps even thousands of the work of dedicated scholars who made the attempt themselves. It erases the very first moment a new kingdom priest looked to the pyramids of Giza and wondered, how did they stack so many blocks? Thank you for stopping by for a booster shot of Egyptology. You can subscribe for weekly videos and maybe see if clicking the like button will bring you good fortune in the coming weeks. The mystics and polymaths searching in vain for the key to understanding me are my backers at patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. My thanks to them as ever, and until next time my fellow armchair Egyptologists, life, prosperity and health to you all. Thanks for watching. Head over to my channel for more, or click here to see what the YouTube demons think you should watch next. I hope you'll consider subscribing. If you'd like to support and collaborate on the channel with me, go to patreon.com slash armchair Egypt. You can also join my Discord community, there's an invite link in the description.